And now a word from our sponsor, Smarsh. Your compliance and supervision strategy will change on November 9th forever. Join top compliance officers from leading RIAs, broker-dealers, and insurance agencies for the virtual event of the year, Smarsh Advance. Compliance and regulatory leaders will converge to share their latest insights and breakthrough innovations in risk oversight for today's explosion of hybrid communications and collaboration technologies. Be among the first to experience this industry-defining event and an exclusive celebrity hangout with television's most beloved and hated fictional compliance officer. Yes, you all know who that is. So please mark your calendars for November 9th. You won't want to miss this. Visit smarsh.com slash advance to register now. That's S-M-A-R-S-H dot com slash advance. We're looking at bringing together the governance risk and compliance activities and the implementation of those controls into a single platform so that the risk is visible, the controls are visible, the implementation of those controls are visible, and how the implementation affects the governance and risk, right? I mean, that's really what the link is. And the reason this is important is because when you look at it, there are a tremendous number of common processes, common expertise, and many things, many parts of this that are cross-functional within legal and compliance. Welcome to the Innovation and Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Dan Scholler from Xterra. Dan, first of all, welcome. And thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. It is my pleasure. Dan, you have a really interesting professional background. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this and bring us up to date with what you are up to these days. My professional background? Well, I've, I've had a lot of different roles in the software industry all the while, you know, including uh, being a Gartner analyst for a while, always focused on data and how data is used, leveraged, communicated. Most recently, I've really been focused on how organizations are organizing their data, governing their data, and, you know, leveraging some of the newer technologies, leveraging AI and, and other techniques, machine learning, other techniques to improve their data value. And this is why I am with Xtero. Xtero is a company that helps organizations deal with legal and compliance risks that are based in data, litigation risk, privacy risk, other types of risks that are associated with data, such as incident response and so forth. So they're an organization that has a portfolio of technology that and that's all based on an integrated platform that they call uh, legal governance, risk and compliance. And I think it's an exciting space to be. A lot is changing in this area, and we're at the cusp of some interesting developments here. Dan, in addition to the substantive portion of this podcast, we're going to talk about Xtero and their solutions. There's one other reason I was really excited to visit with you, and that's that for the last five years or so, you've focused on product marketing. As you know, many of the listeners to this podcast are compliance officers or other corporate officers. And I find that when I can visit with someone like yourself who has a focus on product marketing, it can really be a very big educational experience for the corporate types to learn how to communicate internally. So, for instance, the customers of a compliance officer are their employees. They don't think about them as customers, but they are. And so I really wanted to maybe start off by asking you, from your product marketing hat, what changes have you seen in marketing of solutions such as the current one uh, you're working with at Xtero, maybe over the past five years or so? And did the pandemic change your approach in any way? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. There's been certainly have been a lot of changes as I've been doing this, most of which have involved the our ability to measure what we do. There's been a lot of things that were done sort of by feel. It didn't mean that they were done wrong. It just meant that 
we did things that seemed right. And, you know, a lot of times that they were reasonable things to do, but reasonable and the best are two different things, right? And so one of the things that has really changed over the last five years is the ability and the ease with which we can measure results and also with which we can test alternative approaches to things. We can test alternative messages. We can test alternative means of delivering those messages and even use technology to help us drive some of that communication in order to make it work. I'll give you one really um, example. It isn't really a product marketing example, but it's something that we've done at Xtero. One of the products that we have at Xtero that, that we're quite well known for is legal hold, litigation hold. So putting things uh, on hold, putting data on hold so it's preserved if it's potentially going to be uh, you know, something that may be part of litigation. And we have actually, it's an AI engine that determines when is the best time to send out hold notifications. Because much of the time, you know, this data may be under a certain individual's, you know, some employee's control, and you need to tell them, hey, make sure you don't delete this stuff. And it turns out that people pay attention to things more often on certain days of the week and at certain times of day. And you're more likely to get compliance if you send it to them in certain days and times. And so our ability to measure things like that is what really makes a difference, you know, as opposed to just saying, oh, we discovered that this thing is should be put on hold, so let's send them the notification right away, versus thinking about what's the means by which we can actually achieve our end objective, right? And being able to use measurement, these kinds of behavioral measurements to get that. That's the real big change. As far as the pandemic is concerned, of course, there's no question, you know, that's changed things as well. I mean, obviously, the importance of things like trade shows has changed and the competition for attention over the digital channel has gone from ridiculous to completely ridiculous. That's changed. That's, those are the two big changes. Dan, we recently chatted via email about a Department of Labor announcement for its Employee Benefits and Security Agency that they'll start conducting cybersecurity audits of plan sponsors. Why is this such a significant development? Yeah, this is a great example. And I think it's a significant development because it's an example of what I see as a very large sort of universal, almost universal change in regulatory posture that affects how compliance organizations really need to think about their responsibilities. What we're seeing here is, I realize I'm about to make a sweeping generalization, so, but you know, historically, the way that regulatory agencies have looked at a lot of the compliance activities was that they trusted the compliance personnel, right? What they did is they wanted to see sort of an end report that said, yes, I did everything I was supposed to do. It was a checklist, more or less, uh, in some sense. Um, this is an example of the organization not only asking for that checklist of what they need to do, but asking for very, very detailed evidence that will display not only the, the minutia of what they did to accomplish those results, but also qualitative information about how well they accomplished those results. And I think that really is a big difference. And it does several things. I mean, one is that it really, really makes organizations focus in not so much on the, how do I say this? It shifts the emphasis of the compliance organization from the reportability of the compliance to the details of the implementation. And I'm not saying that compliance organizations are not focused on the details of the implementation, but at the end of the day, the thing that they get most held heavily accountable for is that it's the ability to report what they're doing. And here now, you not only have to report it, but you have to report all the details as well. And in this case, we've also got the situation where the level of detail that they're requesting is quite tremendous. And I think this is stemmed from 
this is coming out in cybersecurity because people are realizing how serious the threat is, particularly in the government agencies where you have, you know, state-sponsored actors and you know, other types of threats. And it really represents a change in the thinking about how regulators are going to interact with the organizations that they regulate. If I could be so bold, I would say they have channeled their inner Ronnie Reagan, trust but verify. I see this as connected to a larger kind of zero trust initiative. I think there were some documents put out for review by the uh, government CIO recently about zero trust architectures for cloud implementation, as a lot of these agencies move their infrastructure to cloud type architectures. So I think, you know, we're really seeing that kind of position that says we're no longer going to assume that everything is okay. We're going to move to a posture where our assumption is that things are not okay, and we're really going to demand detailed proof that we're making them okay. Let me focus on that point related to cybersecurity incidents and the requirement now, or at least the suggestion that it appears the Department of Labor wants plan sponsors to demonstrate how they responded. Could you walk us through that, maybe what that might entail and what you think the regulators may be looking for? Well, obviously, we don't know exactly what they're looking for, but having an incident response plan, I think what's happened here is when people think about cybersecurity, the first thought that leaps to mind, obviously, is prevention, right? Have I put up the right firewalls and other mechanisms in my organization to prevent the bad people from getting in, right, and getting a hold of information. And clearly, that's something that we, all organizations, need to focus a lot of time, money, attention, and expertise on. There's no question about that. But the events of the last couple of years have demonstrated that the escalation of the cyber incidents and the severity of ransomware attacks and, you know, all, all the things that have gone on have really demonstrated that no amount of prevention is ever going to be perfect. And that a big part of what is necessary to limit the impact of these events, assuming that they are going to occur eventually, that this is a discussion of when and not if, that, that limiting the impact is also a big part of what we need to do from a cybersecurity perspective. And therefore, the incident response is essentially as important as the prevention part of that. And when you look at incident response, there are really two parts to that. This is something else that I think is just kind of becoming apparent across the industry. It's been clear for a while that one needs to respond to an incident in a technical sense, right? We need to isolate whatever has happened in our environment. We need to close off that portion of the network, isolate whatever, you know, and dispose of whatever malware is there. We need to gather whatever evidence that we have so we can potentially catch the perpetrators. There's a lot of different things that we need to do at a technical level to, to help manage that. And so, you know, we need to establish business continuity, bring systems back up, possibly at alternate instances, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also a business response that needs to happen, right? And again, depending on the type of organization, the regulatory environment, whatever, we need to do that. But certainly the data privacy regimes have put a lot of pressure on this. The European data privacy regulation, the GDPR, has a requirement that if uh, personal information about European citizens is exposed, the, uh, the organization has 72 hours to report that to the regulator from the time the incident was discovered. That's a short window, you know? There is no way that that kind of regulatory compliance is gonna be achieved without a really tightly coordinated incident response plan and a lot of automation around that response plan. And so that's the new thing that I think is here, is that the organizations are looking at how tightly coordinated are your incident response plans? Are you prepared to respond not only with to the regulatory requirements, certainly, as well as to the technical requirement, and to be able to fulfill all of those obligations and to do so in a way that you can you know, do repeatedly 
because the assumption is that, again, it's when, not if, and the danger is increasing faster than our ability to keep it away. Dan, anyone who has ever heard me speak, or probably anyone who's ever heard me on a podcast, has heard me say the following. The three most important things in any compliance program are document, document, document. And it strikes me that you have just articulated the Tom Fox mantra over the past 15 years, but it really leads me to want to ask about Xtero's core product, Smart Breach Review, and how that can help companies, plan sponsors, or others really who have this obligation demonstrate the compliance with not simply the regulations, but also other stakeholders who may have an interest or an investigative obligation, such as internal audit, external audit, or others who are looking at the overall compliance regime. Gotcha. Yeah. Xtero has a number of products here. Smart Breach Review is one in the portfolio that help. Xtero has a product called Incident and Breach Management, which is an automation product for your incident response plan. So what it does is it allows you to codify and automate your incident response plan into a series of workflows that are role-based and can be segmented by incident type and jurisdiction and, and so forth, so that when an incident occurs, that all of the activities that can be done without human intervention are done that way. And those activities that require people are done by the right people at the right times Things can happen simultaneously and people aren't, we don't have miscommunications, nobody drops the ball, there's, you know, all of that because, again, we are on these extremely tight timeframes. The other good thing about it is that it logs every activity. It has a secure communication mechanism that is independent of any of the corporate communication mechanisms, which may have been compromised in the incident, and that it logs all of that as well. All of that helps with the auditability of the response, as well as in some cases, it may help with the nature of, of legal privilege if there's any subsequent litigate, litigation that depends on circumstance, of course. And then because it's automated and because you have this thing codified in some way, the effort to execute the incident response plan is, it's not like trying to do it out of a book. And so what people tend to do when they have it automated is that they tend to practice, which is another big part of managing an incident. These incidents, they are happening regularly to organizations, but they don't happen frequently enough that people are really familiar with what they do. And often there's at least one or two participants in the incident response who have changed roles or new to their role, you know, whatever it is, there's always something that isn't smooth, isn't clean, isn't exactly the la- way you did it last time. And so the ability to continuously practice this incident response so that you can maintain that level of competency is very important. That's one piece of this. Now, as part of that, we also have our product we'll call FDK, FDK Central, which is an investigation product, forensic investigation product which will allow you to examine what exactly happened in the technical environment and to gather evidence there. So using a product that has been proven in criminal cases for a decade, so that you can, if there's an opportunity for you to you know, prosecute the perpetrators, you have the evidence available to you. We also have a product that we call Smart Breach Review, which is specifically the one you mentioned, which is specifically for finding the data, the personal data, the sensitive data in information that's been compromised. So I mentioned GDPR. One of the things that you have there in GDPR and also in the California legislation, privacy legislation, and in some others, is that if there is a breach of personal information, you are not only required to report that to the regulator, but you also have obligations to those third parties whose information has been exposed. And so you need to know who they are and be able to get in touch with them and tell them, hey, your information's been exposed or may have been exposed and and so forth. So we have a product that uses artificial intelligence 
to comb through compromised data and to find information, you know, find things like phone numbers and addresses and so forth, and associates all of that with individuals and puts all that together so that you can figure out whose information it is and what information of theirs has been exposed. That's the collection of things that Xtero has that help organizations manage their responses to these types of cybersecurity incidents. Dan, I'd like to now turn to the Xtero website itself, because I found it to be, frankly, a great resource for multiple compliance practitioners. And as a blogger, I'm always going to the blog tab first. And then I was pleased to see you're a blogger as well. And you had a blog post I wanted to ask you about. It's entitled Data Privacy Alert Vendor Risk Management. And in this blog post, you wrote about the Ascension Enforcement Action, where the company did not assess process risks of their third-party vendors. But at the end of that blog post, you drew a larger lesson that I wanted to focus on. And the larger lesson you drew was that it's not simply to assess that risk. It's a continual assessment of that risk. And so I really wanted to ask, why did you make that sort of leap from not simply assessment, but then to continuous monitoring of your third parties? And perhaps how does Xtero help a company in that part, which I absolutely agree with you, that can continuous monitoring is the mandate from the regulators now. Yeah, it's one of those things that when you say it, it seems kind of self-evident, but it just hasn't been the way we've thought about it before. I mean, if we look at a lot of the data breaches have come through third parties, that's been a huge thing. I think we've seen just tremendous numbers of those types of scenarios where some kind of service provider or anything has has been the source of a data breach. I mean, wasn't it several, quite a number of years ago, wasn't the, I think it was target data breach that came through like an HVAC provider or something. But today's digitally transformed world, there are just endless numbers of places where we have connections to third parties. I mean, that's the preferred means of doing business, right? And so these connections are constantly coming and going. You establish an electronic connection with an organization that you may do one transaction with, right? It's just not unusual. And so the idea that this portfolio of third-party connections needs to be constantly monitored for its security posture is not unusual at all. And the vendors themselves are in the same state, right? I mean, they are constantly changing they're connected to, as well as, you know, what they do is with regard to connections. So it's important that the interconnectedness of our current environment is a source of great flexibility. It also implies a level of constant variability as well. And we need to make sure that we are always, we assume that when we looked at things last time, we can't assume that they are the same as they were. It's not reasonable to assume that. And we're moving toward an environment where that's always the way. Today, we, it's not unusual for us to purchase software that just changes on us every couple of weeks, right? Xero's products are SaaS products, and we release new iterations of them every few weeks. None of them are disruptive. If there are disruptive changes, you get to opt in on them. But that kind of thing happens from a business perspective as well, where, you know, the portfolio of organizational systems that you have probably changes every few weeks and that can affect the security posture. And so you need to figure out a cadence compromise between how often do we have to look at these things and how often can we look at these things and make sure that they're still the same, they still meet our standards for security and compliance versus the effort required to do that investigation over and over again. And again, automation is the key. We need to automate that investigation. Let me change the focus just a little bit, Dan, and ask you, could you define legal GRC and how or the solution that Xtero provides in that space? Sure. Xtero refers to itself as a legal GRC provider. GRC obviously is a well-established 
thing. And there are legal implications and compliance implications to everything in GRC, of course. But legal GRC is not that. Legal GRC is specifically the governance, risk, and compliance activities that affect the legal and compliance organizations. And there are other GRC subsets like legal GRC. There is HR GRC. There is uh, finance GRC. There are various operational activities that all have their own GRC specific to those organizations that are not part of the overall corporate governance GRC that they are talking about. And so we're looking at bringing together the governance risk and compliance activities and the implementation of those controls into a single platform so that the risk is visible, the controls are visible, the implementation of those controls are visible, and how the implementation affects the governance and risk, right? I mean, that's really what the link is. And the reason this is important is because when you look at it, there are a tremendous number of common processes, common expertise, and many things, many parts of this that are cross-functional within legal and compliance. So, Dan, the regulators, certainly in the anti-corruption compliance space, and it sounds like in a wide variety of other compliance spaces, have made clear that silos of data are verboten and that you have to have visibility and access to that information. It also ties together with what I think is the business point you raised about continuous monitoring leading to continuous improvement. So we've now had the regulators say that this siloed approach is not best practices and we're going to frown upon it. And it really leads me to bring up the one phrase that struck me the most about Xtero, and that's, quote, bring it all together in one platform. So I was wondering if we may be able to visit about that for a minute because it, it touches on so much in the compliance world, in the legal world, but the broader business world as well. So could you tell us about bringing it all together? Sure. Again, this is in the context of what I just spoke about in Legal GRC. All of the legal and compliance risk is based on your data and exactly what you just spoke about. Is your data siloed? How does it relate to one another? How much do you have? Where do you have it? You know, how do you protect it? How do you organize it? You know, all of that. What the legal GRC platform is based on is an inventory of data that tracks all of that information. Who's responsible for it? What business processes use it? All of that information. Now, some of that information is straight up needed to comply with certain regulations, right? The data privacy regulations, for example, many of them demand that you identify processing activities that process personal data. That's just there. But also, you need that same level of information for a lot of the data protection regulations. And you also need that information really to properly comply with certain types of regulations. The simplest example I can think of to bring things together is to think about any sort of action that wants you to remove, to dispose of something. So I'll take, I've been focused on privacy a lot recently, so I'll continue down that vein and take a, what's called a right to be forgotten request. You know, this is one of the rights that people have over their own personal data under many of the privacy regimes that they can request that an organization get rid of all the data that they have. And that's one of the the things that the privacy legislation lets you do. But there are conflicting issues there, right? If that data is subject to some other retention regulation, then the organization can't get rid of it. Or if that data is subject to a litigation hold, that data is included in a criminal investigation or something like that. I mean, all of those things would prevent that deletion, that disposal request from being carried out. But if you don't have that comprehensive view of your information, and you also don't have a comprehensive view of your processes, your GRC processes, you're never going to be able to figure that out. And you're going to do something that will get you in trouble with one of those rules. You're either going to violate the litigation rules, you're going to violate the privacy rules, or you're going to violate the, the compliance rules, you know? That's why there needs to be a lot of common process 
there are also some opportunities there that are leverageable around when you have common data and common ways of processing them. It turns out that being able to recognize types of documents, for example, is an extremely useful thing in all sorts of environments. So it's useful when you're trying to categorize information from a compliance risk perspective. It's also useful when you're looking to categorize information from a privacy risk perspective. It's also useful when you're trying to discover the, the types of information that may be there because you know, for example, that a medical insurance claim is going to contain certain types of information that are going to be different than some other kind of doc. So the idea that we can leverage all of this technology in a common way makes all of our processes smarter, faster, more accurate, and also gives us more opportunity to, at a very detailed level, be able to demonstrate the accuracy of those processes. Again, the more you automate, the more you can demonstrate, right? That's always the case. People are terrible at explaining what they do. <laughs> so that's always a month that you see as well. Dan, let me turn now to that veiled land of the future and ask you, uh, looking down the road, maybe 2025 or even beyond, where do you see GRC tech solutions? I see really three things. First is that in the same way that we have built a legal GRC construct, I think it will be commonplace for there to be these GRC subsets that focus, that not only think a lot of GRC that are focused very much on the implementation of controls, right? A lot of GRC today is about the recording. It's about evidence, the recording of the final evidence of the controls, as opposed to the actual you know, operational implementation of those controls. I think we're going to see a lot more of a shift there. The other big thing that I see is that the GRC world is going to include ESG and ethics. Those are the big parts of this. You know, we're going to see a lot more about it's not only going to be about compliance with regulation, but also about compliance with policy and intent. Those two things are not fundamentally different, but they're subtly different in that you know, there's policy and intent that what you want to say about that is a little bit more subjective. Dan, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I wanted to ask if our listeners wanted any more information on yourself, some of the topics you've raised, or Xterra, where could they go? Well, you certainly can find a lot of information at the Xterra website. That's xterra.com, E-X-T-E-R-R-O. You're also welcome to email me directly. I am Daniel.Scholler, that's S-H-O-L-L-E-R, at Xtero.com. Well, Dan, this has been a fascinating exploration of a wide variety of topics that, frankly, every compliance practitioner needs to be aware of. I have to congratulate you again for the phrase, bringing it all together, and I hope that we can continue this discussion. My pleasure. It's good to talk to you, Tom, and I'll uh, hopefully talk to you again soon. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.